Three years ago, I interviewed economist and futurist Tony Siba about his seminal study on transportation in which he predicted that autonomous vehicles, think robo-taxis, would replace 95% of all miles traveled in the United States by 2030. Nobody would own cars because it would be so cheap to take these robo-taxis. He said they were gonna start rolling out in 2020, so here we are at the end of 2020. Where are they? Not here yet. But last week, Elon Musk and Tesla rolled out the fully self-driving beta test. And so we're gonna to talk to uh, engineer Matthew Klippenstein about that. So welcome to the interview, Matthew. Well, thanks very much, Markham. So let's start with uh, maybe it's a little background on autonomous driving. Uh, where are we at with that? So autonomous driving is, uh, has been talked about for many years. Uh, it is typically discussed in the uh, scale from the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, with something like a driver assistance program, you know, something like a, a souped up uh, cruise control being listed as a level two, something requiring human intervention, going all the way up to level five, which is a fully autonomous vehicle, which does not require human intervention. So that's kind of the, the definitions around that there. With respect to where we are, um, Google's Waymo um, uh, division company uh, has been uh, driving uh, level five or, or very similar to level five of vehicles around in California as well as Phoenix. Last year, they, they pulled about two million kilometers with one intervention one time per about 16, 17,000 kilometers. The computer was confused or muddled and sort of uh, the, the vehicle stopped to avoid an accident. So just like William Gibson said, the future is here. It's just not very evenly distributed yet. How's that? That's, that's a very good description. And there, ever since uh, Elon Musk uh, you know, announced on Twitter, he's kind of like Donald Trump. It's where he does mm -hmm. a lot of his, his public speaking. Yeah. Ever since he announced that last week, there's been a lot of debate, shall we say, on Twitter uh, about the significance of it. So how should we view FSD from Tesla? Um, I believe in the regulatory filings, that uh, Tesla has filed, their FSD is classified as a level two um, ADS, ADAS system, a dri uh, an automated driver assistance system. So it is, it is uh, something which requires the human driver to be able to intervene at any moment. That's basically the, the, class the official classification, not the tweeting classification. Um, there was a recent uh, consumer reports test, I believe, uh, where GM Super Cruise also fitting into that category, perhaps level three, something which would require less intervention, did score somewhat higher than a Tesla system, in part because it has what we call driver monitoring. It has sensors designed to ensure the driver is still paying attention. Um, as with any human activity, if something's kind of going along okay, we, we tend to you know, not be as diligent. Certainly in the old Windows 95 days, I would not save files as often as I should, and gosh, that really cost me hours at various points. So in a similar way with autonomous driving, one of the safety considerations is, um, how do you make sure that the, the, the driver doesn't do something irresponsible, take their eyes off the road, just in case they have to make a split second decision to avoid an accident? Well, thank you very much for that Windows 95 reference. I actually got that. Uh, you know, old DOS user here. So if, if I, my takeaway from this, uh, Matthew, is that uh, Tesla has overhyped this. Now, I understand that some of what, uh, some of the level five gear and software is in the car. So presumably, uh, I think that uh, Musk said uh, you'd be able to, you can summon your car from the garage, for instance, right. or from the parking garage, something like that. Mm -hmm. You just can't at this point uh, uh, take, you know, sit in the back seat and uh, have a nap while the car is, is driving. And the same, I guess, but you can do that with the, the Waymo vehicle. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I think the strongest validation of, the, uh, of, the, of Waymo's technology, and again, there are several other companies who are also leaders in the space, but the strongest validation I've read has been that Volvo, uh, the Swedish slash Chinese car company, uh, is integrating, uh, is doing work with Waymo for their level four autonomous 
vehicle system and that Volvo will take legal responsibility if there are crashes or incidents. And that's very important because that indicates that the, the car maker is, is saying, you know, I will put our money on the line that this is safe as opposed to the risky run if, someone's, if someone gives you a piece of equipment, you misuse it and they say, well, it's not our fault because you weren't using it properly. So that I think is the strongest validation uh, of the of the promise of autonomous vehicle technology. I would guess just basically because this is much in many ways a data play that Waymo and these other leaders would be well positioned to uh, to continue with leadership going forward. Yeah, we really can't understate uh, Volvo's decision here because uh, liability and who it should be assigned to mm -hmm. is was a huge uh, uh, roadblock or a speed bump, if you will to adoption of autonomy, the autonomous driving. So right. if you have an accident, is it the manufacturer of the car? Is it the owner? Is it the software? Is it the data uh, provider? Is it the, who the heck is it? Who, you know, what failed that, that caused right. that accident and maybe killed somebody? So for Volvo to step right. up like that kind of sets a precedent and I can see why that's really important. Now, I'm gonna, this is a final question, Matthew, and I'm gonna ask you to put on your futurist hat, look into, okay. gaze into your crystal ball. When are we gonna have robo taxis and transportation as a service where we just simply pay every time a robo taxi comes and takes us where we wanna go? So I would say that, so again, in some areas, in some parts of California, in Phoenix, these do exist. Some of Waymo's vehicles in Phoenix, in California are driverless. They are fully automated. Um, uh, admittedly, the, uh, they want to make sure that the customers understand the significance and so forth. So it's here. It will expand somewhat. I understand there is a desire, maybe not a 100% need, but there's a desire to have excellent, excellent maps of all the areas so that you can cross-reference your location. Oh, is this branch now blocking a stop sign or is that a yield sign or is that just, I don't know, a balloon in the background, that kind of a thing. So I do believe it's coming. I believe that personal vehicles um, are less likely to be one of these uh, these first applications because the money you could save in perhaps freight transportation uh, could be significant. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of truckers tend to be older. It's not really a, a job that many people. Um, it, it's not as comfortable as certain office jobs or perhaps journalist jobs, and so uh, Waymo has already made strong inroads to develop the uh, uh, the technology for for freight transportation. And here again, one of the advantages with freight is that uh, if your time is spent on highways, there tend to be fewer obstacles and barriers than pedestrians or kids or pets uh, crawling, uh, uh, crawling or running around. So I do believe it is coming. I think Tony Sieber might be a little bit on the optimistic side, say. Uh, and I do believe that transportation as a service is going to be something of a challenge, um, simply for the fact that even people who have a lawn tend to have their own lawn mower as opposed to sharing it with a neighbor, which is kind of lawn mowing as a service. Um, with personal vehicles, I think they, these are consumer goods. They're, they're things that aren't really commodities for us. The way that, I don't know, like socks, I don't care what brand of socks I buy, but uh, your car says something about you. I think that is less likely to become transport as a service. But um, Amazon already is, uh, uh, I believe, is now shipping more of its own packages than FedEx or UPS. And in this case, we can see kind of the shipping and freight transportation as a service developing and perhaps dominating soon. Yeah, indeed, you know, FedEx and UPS, the post office, those are as a service. Well, that's very interesting. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, I would kill to have a trucker's annual salary. <laughs> okay, my, my, my mistake. Um, the truckers I know um, with, with younger families, um, you know, I, I imagine would like to spend a bit more time at home. But... That is correct. That is true. Fair enough. Well, thank you very much for this, Matthew. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be talking to you again in the near future. Uh, you're very welcome. And uh, I look forward to being defeated by you in Scrabble soon. <laughs>